Hare Krishna, dear Vaishnavi, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Welcome to our July Vaishnavi Ministry of North America Sangha. Um, thank you all so very much for being here today. We are so fortunate to have with us Her Grace Sukhavaha Devi Dasi, who is just a wonderful devotee. She was born and raised as a Protestant minister's daughter, counseling and assisting others in the household was always given. Inspired by her father, who at the age of 84, still attended self-development seminars, she graduated with a bachelor's degree in social welfare from Pennsylvania State University. During her youth, she went on spiritual quests and accepted initiation into Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Bhakti tradition in India, which stems from the 16th century, and was given the name Sukhavaha Devi Dasi. With her counseling skills coupled, um, her counseling skills, I'm sorry, coupled with spiritual knowledge, she was ordained an interfaith minister in January of 1992. And Sukhavaha Devi Dasi has been involved in a number of social welfare projects across the globe including the Varshana Eye Camp and Spiritual Care Department of Bhaktivedanta Hospital in Mumbai. She frequently speaks at leading spiritual communities on compassionate communication, emotional healing, and building vibrant organizations. She has developed a heart connection as a safe space or safe support system based on her own life's journey for inner peace and for developing deeper relationships. She is also an author of Revealing the Heart, Practice of Compassion, a memoir of her experiences integrated with her new discoveries in compassionate communication. And she is also the mother of three children and grandmother of, it's more than two now, right? It's three, okay. <laughs> grandmother of three. And she also has some other exciting books that she's working on. So please join me in welcoming Her Grace Sukhavaha Devi Dasi. Welcome to our Sangha. Thank you again for gracing us with your presence. It's so wonderful to have you back with us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I always um, appreciate being in the association with Vaishnavis. Um, I feel um, sometimes we don't have enough uh, association just for women and as women we hear a lot from swamis who are men and gurus who are mostly men and um, a lot of classes are given by men now more and more women are giving classes but um, it's really nice to be able to have this venue to share with one another as women so I want to say a prayer or two um, before we begin to ask the blessings of our spiritual lineage, Om Agyana Timurandasya, Gina Gina Shalakaya, Chakshur Om Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurve Noha, Sri Chaitanya Manobistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale, Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam, Vandeham Sri Guru Sri Uta Parakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavamsha, Sri Rupam Sagujatam Sahagana Raghunatham Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitam Sha He Krishna Karuna Sinda Du Dina Bandu Jigatpate Gopi Shagopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namoshite Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sutta Devi, Pranamami Hari Priye, Vanchikalpa Tribhyas Chak, Kripa Sindhi Bhyeva Chak, Patita Nampara Nebhya Vaishnava Bhyo Namo Namaha. Maam Vishnu Vidaya Krishna Vasudaya Bhutale, Shemati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Eti Namine, Namaste Sarasvati Devi, Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shindivada Vishachita Shitarine. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shivas Adikor Bhaktivinda 
हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे प्लीज डियर लॉर्ड कृष्ण चैतन्य महाप्रभु नित्यानंद प्रभु शिल प्रभुपाद प्लीज help us to speak from our heart to connect to our inner wealth and to be a a space where you may reveal deeper truths deeper understanding and the courage and patience to continue on this bhakti path hi krishna okay so today's class is entitled um, anartas isolation or integration so i wanted to start with a question because i'd like to hear from all of you like what is an anarta what does what what does the word anarta mean to you when you hear the word anarta what do you think how do you feel so please just hi. you can either raise hi. your hand or unmute yourself and speak oh. hi krishna hi. go yeah, ahead hi this is gail Oh, Gail. Okay. All right. I didn't see you. All right. Yeah. Let me see if I, um, anyway, it's too complicated for me. Um, <clears throat> anarcha for me means anything that obstructs our progress in developing love for Krishna. Anything that, anything that obstructs your love for Krishna. My, my my progress in developing that. Okay, your progress in developing your love. Okay, nice, nice. Okay, and and um, uh, Kushbu, you have your hand raised. Yeah, it's it's anything which uh, which are huge uh, um, huge blocks that has that you know prevent us from uh, surrendering to our Gurudev and Krishna ultimately. Huge blocks that keep us from surrendering to our Guru Dev and Krishna. Okay, he Heather. Um, our shortcomings or the shadows. What's not and what's not being brought to the light. What we Shad can't see. Ah, shadows. What's not being brought to the light. What we can't see. I, I think we've got a bunch of wise women here. <laughs> Anybody else have any thoughts or? feelings when they when you hear the word anarta what feeling might it bring up in you not enough not enough okay not enough mm -hmm. anybody else what feelings does it bring up perhaps a little bit of guilt or disappointment in self guilt or disappointment in self okay Fall down, it comes. Fall down, the word fall down comes into your mind. Okay, very good. Um, anything else? So my question next, the question would be, are we, af are we afraid of anartas? Are we, do we have some fear of the anartas? Just a general question. A little, yeah. I would Yes. Okay. I would say we have a fear of anartas and not just a fear of anartas. We have a fear of other people seeing our anartas. Ah, very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Yes. Yeah. So um, I didn't realize this, but when I, when I wrote my first book, I did some research and uh, Prabhupada gives a definition of an arta. And um, he defines arta first. So arta, the meaning of an arta is substance. So anarta means it has no substance, it's illusory, and it has no 
meaning, it's meaningless. And anartha is meaningless. So when I read that, I, I was kind of surprised. I thought that's really pretty different from, you know, what I was brought up to think about, about anarthas. When I hear the word anarthas, I just remember <clears throat> stories in classes about demons and the anarthas are like demons. And so if I have anarthas, then I'm, I'm full of demons or I'm demoniac or I'm really bad or something like that. Very scary and very like something, ooh, yeah. I don't even wanna recognize that there's any of those there because that means there's something wrong with me. <laughs> That's part of my um, conditioned responses to the word anartas. But when I saw this meaning um, by Srila Prabhupada, it really struck me. Um, now this material world is called an illusory world. And the illusion, it's called illusory because it's temporary. We know that theoretically. However, it's really illusory, especially when we invest and believe mm, the stories and the um, misidentifications that are brought up by the material energy, by our conditioned mind, by our conditioning. And um, when, we, when we start to identify with our conditioning, um, we become very um, um, fearful and very, uh, we start to kind of almost solidify our conditioning. So anartas, when we look at them as illusory, 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 they're meaningless. So where do these anartas come from? Like, how do they come up? How do they, how do they begin? How do they arrive? So from my understanding and what I'm writing about in my book, I have a book that I'm writing about anartas. Um, anartas are strategies that we've developed through our conditioning through our belief systems, our unconscious beliefs, their strategies to get our needs fulfilled. Now, the reason um, they're considered illusory is because they're kind of compensating strategies and they're strategies that are based on lies. So let's take a specific um, Let's take a specific one. Let's take, let's take envy, for example. So, oh my gosh, nobody wants to be considered envious because, you know, we'll never learn spiritual life if we're envious. Krishna said to Arjuna, because you are not envious, I can reveal these truths. So, oh my gosh, I never want to be envious. <laughs> what, what is envy and where does it come from? So in my understanding, um, envy comes from a, a mentality of scarcity, that there's not enough and that I'm not enough. Now, this mentality that I'm not enough is, very, is, is perpetuated in this material world because it's almost a given factor. Um, so... I'm gonna backtrack a little bit here. Um, in coming to this material world, we're a soul and right now we're trapped in a human machine. Now the human machine is one of the most challenging and I would say 
excruciatingly painful bodies to be in because we have this thing called consciousness. So not only are we aware of our pain and our suffering, but we add a lot of meaning to our pain and suffering. So we've come to this material world and, and um, we, we, even when Lord Brahma created the material world, he had to create uh, a certain amount of denial. He had to create, um, he had to first create self delusionment that, that we, that we, that we don't really, um, I forget the exact words, but that we deny, we have to deny our soulness to be able to be here. Because if we didn't deny it, it would be just too excruciating. And yet to be to 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 connect with our true self and our real self, we really have to contend with that denial. And, and each one of the anartas is a certain denial of a truth which can, can, can help to liberate us. And at the same time, it can bind us if we believe the lie of that anarta. So again, let's go back to envy. So an envy is kind of based on a scarcity mentality. There's not enough or I'm not enough and I've got to push or grab or prove or obtain um, in order to be enough, in order to have enough. So, so what would be the needs that we're trying to fulfill through the thought processes of envy? Does anybody have any guesses? What need might we be trying to fulfill? Worthiness. Worthiness. Okay. I think the biggest one is the need for love. The need for love. Yeah. And maybe anybody else have any other ideas? Worthiness, love. I want to say adoration, but I feel like that's not a good thing. How about acceptance? Acceptance. Yeah, being accepted, accepted, acceptable. Um, being um, like the acknowledgement that I am something, I'm not nothing, which is the basis of our bhakti tradition. Um, you know, the impersonalists are that we're all merged into the big energy of the supreme being and we're all parts of that big merge and our, our personalist philosophy shows us that we are always a person and yet this material world is so big and we are so tiny we tend to get overwhelmed and then kind of feel small and as you said before maybe guilty I would use more the word shame, like we feel shameful. And then we want to hide. And then, but then when we hide, we don't necessarily get our needs met. And so then we kind of compensate by trying to grab and then hiding that we grabbed. So how are we going to get our needs met? Um, again, Uh, shame is one of the initial feelings in coming to this material world. There's a story in the Bible, the Garden of Eden. And um, it was explained to me in a very beautiful way by Varshana Maharaj. Um, so Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden and everything is there. All abundance is there. And they're, um, they're joyful. And then God says, you can eat fruit from any tree, but do not eat the fruit from this tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So 
you know, we might think, well, why doesn't why doesn't want God want Adam and Eve to know good and evil? Um, so they did partake of the tree, and then their consciousness was flooded with good and evil, which is the 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 uh, epitome of duality. The duality. So. This is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is bad. I don't have clothes on, I should be ashamed. Um, I'm, I, I disobeyed God by eating from that tree, now I'm really shameful. Um, and then wanting to hide that shame. And then when we hide that shame, then we hide ourselves. and then we're hiding, but we still wanna to try to get something, so we try to grab it. So it's really convoluted, but it's all based on illusion. It's all based on the illusory energy. And um, the anartas are really strategies to meet our spiritual needs, but they don't work <laughs> because they're based on the misconception, not that I'm part and parcel of Krishna, but they're based on the misconception that I'm shameful, I'm less than, I'm, uh, I'm, not good enough. I'm unworthy. They're based on all these lies. So on top of a lie, you can't really come to the truth. We have to disassemble the lie. So um, to me, the practice of understanding the anartas and what they have to show us and what they have to teach us and then taking those lessons from the Anartas and being able to hear the voice of the Anarta just as kind of like a young child crying for its needs, but not being able to fully articulate with clarity. Like when a child cries, the parents pretty much have to kind of like guess what the child needs. Are they tired? Are they hungry? Is their diaper dirty? What do they need? So it's kind of like a guessing process. And as um, time goes on, they get better at understanding the different cries or the different times of the day, or even the different types of crying a child may have. Now, that's great that parents do that for us. As adults, though, we tend to sometimes hide our pain and we're not clear about our own needs. And so in not being clear about our own needs, we can't articulate. And when we can't articulate, we cry out with the anartas. It's not fair. They have more than I have. Um, you know, um, I need more. It, it, and and these, these are cries of a child voice, and those are the cries of isolation. So the anartas tend to isolate us more from Krishna. We're already separated. We're here in this material world. We don't really belong here. We're separated. But then the anartas, as a strategy to fulfill our needs, they actually cause us to separate ourselves even more and isolate from Krishna. But when we can look at the anartas, and as you said, Heather, like our shadow sides, well, we can look at them and say, okay, well, what is that part of me trying to tell me? What does that part need? Um, you know, how can I fulfill that need in a way that's um, practical and that's Krishna conscious and that's... Um, sustainable. Now, another thing we do as human beings in this world of duality, the, the good and the evil, the knowledge of the good and the evil, is that we look for quick fixes. We don't like feeling pain and we don't like feeling uncomfortable. And we don't like necessarily looking at our pained parts because it feels uncomfortable. And so rather than look at them, we want to kind of cover them over 
or um, mm, hide them or overdo, like overcompensate for what we think is lacking in us. And this actually is more of the same. So say I believe that mm, no one wants to listen to me. Okay, so now if, if I believe that, I don't necessarily have to be conscious that I believe that, but if I have that belief inside, nobody really wants to hear what I have to say. Nobody wants to listen to me. What might I do to compensate for that belief? Does anybody have any ideas? Shout, speak loudly. <laughs> shout or speak loudly. Who said that? Gail. Gail, okay. Shout or speak loudly. Okay, that was, that was a good point. Anybody else have any ideas? The opposite, not talk. Mm, not talk. Mm. How is that going to get us to be heard? <laughs> that might be something else on top of it. That might be resignation. Nobody wants to hear me, so I might as well not talk. Which then perpetuates that belief, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to hear me. I'm not going to talk. Yeah, it's true. Nobody hears me. Nobody understands me. I perpetuate it. That's a pretty easy one to see. Now, how about the shouting and talking louder? Um, this was something that I experienced in my life. Something happened to me when I was five in the hospital and the nurse didn't listen to me. And, um, and I was speaking very loudly, <laughs> but she didn't listen to me when I said I didn't want to go first for the surgery. There were five other little kids that could have gone. And I said I didn't want to go first, but she took me first. So I didn't know this until I was almost 50, but I decided that no one listens to me and they do the opposite of what I tell them. So how I compensated was I started talking louder and started pushing my point a little bit more. And as I got to be a teenager, I was pretty good at debate. I could talk you down. Yeah, I could prove my point. You know, I used my intelligence to prove my point. Now, since I proved my point, you have to listen to me because I'm right. You know, so that was helpful in debate. I don't know if it was very helpful in making my friends. With my friends, though, I wouldn't tell them anything. Because I also had a story I wasn't lovable. So I'm not going to tell my, make my friends listen to me. I'm going to listen to my friends. Because if I listen to them, maybe they'll listen to me. So it's just interesting how we do this. But then as I got older, then I became a devotee at 21. And so then I had the absolute truth. Now I have every right to really push this. Because this is not just me speaking. This is Krishna speaking. So I'm going to push this. So, you know, it may have worked with some people, but with my parents, it had the opposite effect. By the time I was in my late 40s, I was very clear that people didn't want to hear what I had to say. <laughs> but I didn't really understand exactly why. I didn't understand the whole dynamics of it. Um, but... After I realized that I had the story that no one listened to me, I started speaking differently. And I realized that my pushiness was pushing people away. And then I got to say, see, I'm right. No one listens to me. So sometimes just being right about our illusory stories, it perpetuates the story because I act like it's already true. And so then I compensate by pushing. I push you away. See, it's true. Nobody wants to listen to me. And that solidifies the story again. So our illusory stories are kind of self-perpetuating unless we distinguish them. When we distinguish our illusory stories, 
we can start to look at them and ask questions about them and ask them where they came from and ask them what they want to teach us. And so, um, yes, self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes, we, 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 we perpetuate and fulfill the beliefs we already have. Now, a lot of times these are all blind spots. We don't really know the beliefs that we have, but the anarchists are very much tied up in the beliefs that we have, the stories that we have about ourselves. And so as we come to identify and distinguish and name, name our shames and, uh, you know, identify what, what an artist am I engaging in? And then just be curious rather than judgmental. Oh, I'm so lusty. I'm so this, I'm so that. Like we can just start to ask ourselves questions. What's that all about? Why do I feel I need to grab things? Why do I feel that there's not enough? Why do I feel that things aren't fair? You know, and really investigating and looking at this in a deeper way and looking at our past. A, a lot of our beliefs come from our past life, but then they also come and are reformed and, and, um, and again, um, stimulated in this lifetime. So um, when we can kind of come to grips with our stories, we can, we can really look at, oh, wow, I'm doing that thing again. Now, for me, I've really shifted from seeing the anartas as something bad to just seeing the anartas as a habit. It's a habit that I've used to try to get my needs fulfilled. You know, and what is this habit? Where did it come from? And is there something else that I could do that may get my needs filled? in a much more sustainable way, not in a self-fulfilling prophecy of proving my illusory belief. So in the example of not being heard, as I learned compassionate communication, I was able to articulate more my feelings and my needs in such a way that other people could understand them in such a way that I could understand them. And I found that my needs were much more often met in me being able to clearly articulate them. Now, it's important for us to take responsibility for ourselves. Um, to me, Krishna consciousness is about self-awareness, and self-compassion. We're here to learn how to take care of our soul. And we need to identify, how am I caring for my soul now? What is it I'm, that I'm doing that, that works and what doesn't work? And, you know, you know, if something's not working, is there another way is there another habit that I could practice which what might really fulfill my need? Um, so this is a basic overview. And to me, it's like, we really wanna to get to the root. You know, when we look at the anarta, by the time we see the anarta in ourselves or in another person, we're actually just seeing the tip of the iceberg. It's just a tiny tip. Same with our false ego. Oh, you know, that was my that was my ego there. And then we pretend that really, whenever we can't see it, it's not really there. <laughs> it's not there because we're only looking just at the tip of the iceberg above the above the water. But there is like a huge portion of the iceberg under the water. And to me, really understanding what's under the water, what's under the surface, really gives us a lot of um, power and understanding how to deal with that 
little tip and in fact, how to melt it. <laughs> because if we chop away at what's going on down there and integrate and understand and bring some light and heat down there and we melt that base, there is no tip anymore. Um, and of course, it's a practice. It's something that we practice day in and day out. So I really wanted to open up, um, you know, this class to discussion because um, I feel a lot of people have questions about an artist and they may have specific questions in their life about what's going on in their life. And so I'd like to see um, if anybody has any questions about what I said, any comments about what I said, any realizations about what I said, or any personal questions. So I'll pause for those kind of things. Like, what did you get from what I said? What did you understand? What didn't you understand? Don't be shy, ladies. <laughs> Now's our chance. We have Mother Sukavaha for another hour or so. So <laughs> we have to absorb all we can from her. And, and shyness may be um, a way of operating too. Like, why would somebody be shy? So let's, let's ask that question. Why would somebody be shy? Does anybody have any thoughts? Yes, because they might be afraid that they're not liked or, you know, they will, people will, I don't know, will have some negative reaction to whatever they might say or have some negative reaction about their personality in general. Just fear of, of negativity from others, maybe. Fear of judgment, uh, fear of yeah. being judged negatively. Okay, all right, fear of being judged negatively. Uh, Kushbu, you have your hand up, yes. I would like to share something like my personal experience. Okay. It's like, uh, I was always rejected like in my life. Uh, actually the thing was, when I was very young, and at that time, I really liked the guy, but he never liked me back. So, and since I was an adolescent at that time, I had, I got that feeling that I am not worthy. Mm -hmm. I'm not uh, good enough. I mean, I was rejected, actually. How so, old were you? I'm sorry. Just I, I, was, I was just 14 or 15, maybe. Uh, I, I mean, I, he, he, I didn't approach him. But I expected him to like uh, uh, approach me. So, but he never, I mean, maybe he was not interested in his life. Now I understood, like, but, but that was a very difficult time because we were so immature at that time. And afterwards I came to know that it was just a, an infatuation, but it had a deep impact on my, I mean, my life. Yeah. When I started feeling rejected, unworthy, not good enough even when i was like 17 or 18 maybe at that time i went into depression because i really felt alone like nobody loves me like huh. this particular huh. line was always striking me nobody loves me nobody loves me yeah I went into depression and i went into a lot of turmoil uh, when i was uh, 18, 19, when I, and then afterwards, it took a very uh, heinous form, because afterwards I became a rebel, kind of a rebel. I yes. became very rebellious, because I thought that, okay, nobody cares for me, then why should I care? So ah, I, very interesting, I, yes. Yes. I became, I became a rebel, like I started misbehaving also, a lot of, uh, a lot of things which I should not have done like uh, disrespecting my elders, not listening to them, purposely doing something which I should not do. Because I thought that, hey, nobody cares for me, so why should I care? So, but afterwards, 
I got uh, when I like in, it was this this continued till I mean now I'm thirty three zero, so this continued till I think twenty till I was twenty six twenty seven, twenty six twenty seven I got uh, uh, Prabhupada's book uh, Perfect Questions Perfect Answers, so I got it in the station I live near station so I got from there. I read that book and it was talking about the, the, actually the chapter of three modes of ignorance. So when I read that, so I, I I started reading, started searching for more of his books. Then I downloaded it on my phone. But after a few days, my phone got crashed. I don't know. And I, as I said, I was a rebel. So I threw away that phone. Okay, this phone is also not rejecting me. Kind of, kind of feeling came. Okay, whatever I want to do. People reject me. This machine, this phone is also very, rejected. very, very interesting. So I got that. I got that feeling that I'm not worthy. So this yeah. stuck me. This stuck me. Even a phone is responding to me like that. Wow. The, <laughs> just, see, just see how much meaning we add to things. Yeah. So that yeah. is the thing, and that is why I registered for this class because ah. this class is very close to me because I ah. need solve a lot of my problems the remaining I mean whatever is there because Prabhupada has solved a lot of problems like in I like in I don't know when I uh, I think I should put my video on because it feels like yes. lots of shadows. Yeah yeah yeah, yeah can I can I uh, you you've just said so much and I don't want to lose all your points. May I say something about all your points because it's it's a lot. First of all I want to acknowledge you for being courageous to you know share some vulnerable parts of your life that's a very big thing and a lot of times people don't um share um and they don't raise their hand because they are afraid of being rejected and they are um i hope i hope is kusbu there you are okay i want to make sure you were still there i couldn't see you um so so sometimes people are afraid of being rejected or afraid of being embarrassed. And so they don't raise their hand, but not only did you raise your hand in the face that, that you do have this fear, but you actually even revered that, revealed that fear vulnerably and publicly. So first of all, I wanna acknowledge you for your courage. So that's a really important thing. Um, it does take courage to break through the stories that we have and every little step that we take to break through the stories that we have is an integration of something deeper. It's an integration of a deeper strength and a deeper understanding. Um, and then the other part that you said that you know you felt unworthy and, and then you became a rebel. That's a, another proof of what we do in the material world of duality in order to compensate for people are rejecting me then we swing the other direction. Okay, they're rejecting me. I'm just going to reject everything else. And so we compensate, but it's it still doesn't mm, it doesn't satisfy our heart and soul because it's based on the lie that I'm rejected or I'm unacceptable. And because it's based on a lie, it perpetuates the lie which doesn't give us the truth of who we really are. And um, so th that's an important point that you showed there. And then another part that you said, which struck me, you said that, you know, you kind of had this feeling around 15 or 16. I would like to say I I'm, I have that feeling because usually it's true that these feelings of rejection or not being good enough or being unworthy start to happen when we're very young. So I imagine there may be things in your own family that happened that had you feel that way about yourself. And then your first kind of like uh, experience outside the family in your head, you like this person. So you're thinking like, I like them. They, I need, I want them to like me. And then they probably didn't even know that you liked them, but you wanted them to like you and then they didn't. So it kind of verified a belief that you already had from when you were a child. Do you think that that has some validity there, what I said? Yeah. 
yeah, I have a big problem in my family. My parents separated. My father has an extramarital affair. So he always kind of neglected me. So you got it like correct. So yeah, yeah. So so this this told me on my face that I didn't want to because he wanted a, that was that's something very deep because he wanted a boy. Uh, ah, oh my gosh. <laughs> The girl so complex. The, deep scar, the, I mean, girl, really. the girl complex. So very, very, very interesting. So yeah, so these are important things for us to recognize. We got a woman's body for some reason. And yes, that feeling of, you know, I'm not a boy and my parents wanted a boy and, um, you know, uh, and I'm rejected. Like I felt like my brother was loved more by my mother and I wanted to be a boy. So I became a tomboy to compensate, but it, it didn't make that feeling of I'm less than go away because that's something I brought with me from my last life. And this, this birth and this body and my family just kind of reawakened me to those, those things that I hadn't resolved from my last life. So yeah. So your experiences as a child um, and being rejected and being even the words that your father said to you, very confusing and very disconcerting. Now, one thing that's interesting, I'd like to say that anything we do externally to kind of compensate for that rejection. Sometimes we'll go out and prove ourselves. We'll go out and get degrees and we'll just show and, you know, and then we'll get external adoration or whatever. That might be one way we do it or be a rebel and become famous as a rebel. And, um, but anything that we do externally, it's kind of like trying to paste something nice on something that's not nice. That's our pain. And so, but anything that we do internally, uh, working with our self-care and our self-acceptance and our self-love, all of that work, we can take with us in our next life because we're working on the subtle body. And as we work to heal our subtle body, nobody can do that for us. And nothing external can necessarily heal that for us. But as we uh, learn to acknowledge and hear our own feelings and needs and hear that wounded child inside of us and pay attention and um, honor that suffering child and the suffering soul inside, we bring a whole new level of understanding and healing to our life that's kind of like healing from the inside out and it's healing and it's revealing and we're opening up and and we get our strength from being vulnerable when we're vulnerable and we can share and we can look at those shadow parts and we can look at those painful parts we actually get a lot of strength and courage inner strength an inner courage, not a proving strength, but an inner strength and an inner acceptance. And nothing can um, replace that. That is our own homework that we do. And um, it comes from understanding ourselves. So you understand where some of these things came from. You have that understanding, and you have that understanding that as a young child, it's very confusing to see parents fighting, parents separating, you know, father leaving, mother being upset. It's so confusing. We don't even understand our own life, but like this is like, it's so bewildering to us. And, and you know, we have mixed feelings because this is my father. I'm supposed to love him. And now I don't love him or he doesn't love me. And so, um, um, then we're confused inside of our head. And then we feel shameful. Oh, I'm mad at my father, but he's my father. But I, so, you know, is there something wrong with me that he left? Is it my fault that he left? Is it my fault that my parents are fighting? All these questions come up and we, we take a lot of things 
personally. And so really coming to grips and understanding our own personal stories and our own personal beliefs about ourselves and about others, and really working to um, look deeper and find deeper truths. Like, hey, I, I suffered a lot as a child and there was a lot of things that were not understandable to me. And in those moments of my childhood, I made up stories. I made up a story that I'm unacceptable, that I'm rejected. I made that story up. Now, you know, in your little girl's mind, trying to figure it all out, it makes sense why you decided that. It makes perfect sense. As an adult person still believing that, it, it, it kind of boxes you in and doesn't allow you to grow. So I'll give an example, and then I'll answer Gail's question. You know, in, in different places, but in New York City specifically, um, in, in the city, they put these wrought iron cages around trees. They're about eight feet tall and they're wrought iron, they're thick iron to protect the tree from cars, knocking them over and all kinds of things. Now those, those wrought iron protections are very important. Now, when we're children, you know, we try to protect ourselves even when we don't understand what's going on inside of our self. Like we to protect ourselves different ways. Sometimes if children get abused, they actually leave their body because a, child, a child's not as attached to their body as an adult is because they're still kind of a little bit in their spirit self. They think they're invulnerable. They don't realize they can get hurt. They run and they jump and run across the street. They're not aware. So sometimes if a child's being hurt and they can't understand or tolerate the pain, they actually leave their body. It's called disassociation. Or they hide in a corner or a closet or they cry, you know, or all of the above. So these are kind of the protective me mechanisms of our mind. If it's overwhelming for a child, the child has to figure out some way to cope. And so it just makes a decision, well, I'm just unacceptable. And that's the only explanation I can make for this because I don't understand the details of it because I'm a child. <laughs> but as an adult, you can understand that your father for whatever reason, they didn't get along and he had another affair. You can kind of understand it, but that story is still there. Now, when you distinguish and understand that you made that story up in your little girl's mind to protect you from like freaking out and not being able to understand all that was going on, then you have the option now as an adult to disseminate that story. That's that's, that's your option. Now, again, as the tree grows, and this is a true story, I saw a tree growing and the bark was growing around the wrought iron. In other words, the wrought iron was cutting in to the tree. I had to call the environmental protection in New York the, and so they would cut out the wrought iron so the tree wouldn't get hurt. So sometimes the protective mechanisms we have as children, as adults, they really start cutting into our ability to um, grow and flourish. And so we need to really disseminate those, those, those fences and, and step out. And um, it, it, it takes courage because we think, oh my gosh, if I take off this right iron, a tree might hit me. I mean, a car might hit me, you know, something might happen, I might get hurt. Yes, yes, we might get hurt. <laughs> However, the fence is hurting us right now. <laughs> it's hurting us now, it's, it's now it's hurting us. So chances are, if we take it off, at least we can grow and we can grow bigger and, and then we may be able to understand uh, withstand maybe other hurts that may come to us as we grow and grow. Or maybe if a car runs into us, maybe we'll hurt the car instead of the car hurting us. So, and this is what Gail's question is, how does vulnerability, what was the question again? 
uh, how does vul being vulnerable make us strong? It's, it's an expression of our strength because being vulnerable, just like, like say you have um, a cut or a wound, you know, when you take off the bandaid and look at the wound, you know, it might be red, it might be tender and it, it, it might hurt. Now um, we put a bandaid on a wound to protect it so that it can heal. Again, just like the wrought iron. But if we leave that bandage on for, you know, and if it's a thick bandage, if we leave it on for 10, 20, 50, you're supposed to change the bandage. If we leave it on, that sore can actually get infected. But sometimes it's, it's so painful. Say we broke our arm, it's so painful. We're afraid to take the cast off because, oh my gosh, my arm might... It's so tender, it might get hurt. Again, you know, we're afraid of getting hurt. So we don't want to take the cast off. We don't want to take the fence down. We're afraid. And so it takes some courage and some faith that, okay, I'm going to take down the fence. I'm going to take off the bandage. I'm going to take off the cast. And I'm going to give it some air and, I, and I'll watch it. I'll be careful to watch it. You know, I'll, I'll understand that it's still tender. Um, so I'll be more conscious, <laughs> but I'm going to take off the protective barrier so that it can heal to another stage. But initially it does take a little courage because you're thinking of how much pain there was when the wound was open and oozing blood or when the arm was broken and, um, you know, so painful and that it couldn't even lift itself. And so we remember those excruciating pains and it, we, we want to buffer that pain. So that goes true for physical pain and it holds true for emotional pain also. We want a buffer. I don't want to be rejected. So I'm not going to have any relationships with anybody because then I'm not going to get hurt. Okay, well, then I'm alone. And that hurts too. <laughs> so at some point, we want to outgrow. We, we are outgrowing the fence. And the fence is causing us more pain than the fear of removing the fence and allowing ourselves to take the risk of being hurt in another way and not making it mean that I'm rejected. Maybe this person isn't the one for me. Maybe this, this relationship was just a practice for me to learn how to talk to people, but this isn't the one that I'm gonna settle down with. You know, we make meaning all the time. Our mind is a meaning-making machine. Somebody says something or somebody gives me a look and I make it mean something immediately. And so it's good for us to recognize what is the meaning my mind is making. So for me, if I see somebody making a look and I don't know what that means, I start to get nervous because my mind starts to make meaning. And so I might say to the person, you know, you're making a face right now and I'm not sure what that means. And my mind is starting to make all kinds of meaning up. So I'm just wondering, are you bored by what I'm saying? Um, are you angry? Did I say something that triggered you? Um, do you have to go to the bathroom? What's going on inside of you that you're making that face because Right now, my mind is making a lot of meaning and I don't want to make that meaning. I want to know the actual fact. So it takes, it takes courage to take that first risk of taking off that fence. So thank you. That was very stimulating. Your share, Kushbu, was very stimulating and it, it brought out more things for me to say. And I'd like to hear from some other... Um, well, did that satisfy things a little bit for you temporarily? that helped. I'd like to hear from some other ladies, you know, what they heard in that conversation or what they heard before or any other questions that, that they might have 
in regards to um, you know what we're talking about here. I would be really grateful to meet you and see you and hear you. I've been around in this movement for about seven years and usually I have no problem being the one that's talking and saying what I have to say. Okay. But it's been pretty much beaten out of me over the past couple of years, I feel like. And I've gotten to a place now where it's a little bit hard to be vulnerable, which is actually, I'm pretty good at being vulnerable. But uh, this lady that just shared, I appreciate your share. And um, I don't want to compare by any means, but like I have the same kind of story, but American style. From my understanding, we come into this world, we choose our parents, and then we're here and we deal with these different karmas that we have to deal with. And we go through the shadow work and we go through these different things that we have to level up through and come through life to, um, uh, in order to grow spiritually and to be able to stand in our truth and be able to yeah. be tall enough to share and say, to be able to say like, hey, um, there's so much stuff going on in the temple right now. Not people aren't feeling or having to deal with those kinds of things. Yeah. But so, so I'm afraid to say that, but at the same time, I need to say that because yes. it's what I'm experiencing. We don't all have the same experience. And yet we, we, a lot of times we'll have similar type stories, but we don't have the same experience of how that story came up. And we don't have the same experience of how it's now manifesting in our life. And so, but the more that we can face it, the more we shine a light on it, 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 it dissipates it. It disappears the illusion of it because it's almost like, it's like, like a shadow, like you say, there's shadows, but then when the light comes out, where are they? You know what I mean? I mean, there, there may be shadows in a certain direction, but um, in the dark, yes. go ahead. It also seems to be, if you're really good at manifesting these things, like I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough. If you're really good at having those thoughts, then you can get other people. Outside. Oh, for sure, for yeah. sure, for so, sure. To, to buy, buy into, into your it. story. Yeah. Yes, they can totally buy into your story. You're a victim. It's true. Oh my gosh. How could they? That's so awful. That's so horrible. And, and, and you know. No, 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 not, not the victim part. The other okay. way. Okay. You're, 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 you're a bad person. You don't, you shouldn't. Oh, oh, you are a bad person. Oh my gosh, yeah. not the victim part. You are a bad person. You shouldn't be able to do that. How could you do that? What's wrong with you? Oh my gosh, you know, like, yeah. You can that, be, yes, yeah, that's what I'm yes, saying. You can yes, get these people to externally yes, manifest yes, this type of stuff. And absolutely. if you can realize, or from what I've realized, that if you can, what I'm starting to realize now or this summer is like my big thing is that if I have worried all of this into manifestation, then if I've come to the realization that I, my thoughts are actually manifesting, if yes. I can switch this thought of like, I am the worst to, I am the best because Krishna loves me. Uh -huh. Then all these people that are like, go away. will be be like, where are you at? Come here, come here. I mean, not so that that's it, what I'm it, trying it, to do. But yeah. This, and, this and, and I hear what you're saying. And that's our thoughts really do have a lot of influence on us. And I want to share something. And it's not by just compensating with the opposite thought. I'm the worst. I'm the best. But more like a thought that's like one step at a time. So I just want to share a, um, if I can find it. Mm, let me see here. I, I wrote something down here. Uh, I want to just read something that I that I wanted to share with everybody. So this is a, a habit from I mean this is a quote from Lao Tzu Tang. Watch your thoughts; they become your words. Watch your words; they become your action. Watch your action; they become your habits. Watch your habits. They become your character. Watch your character. It becomes your destiny. So this is the um, self-fulfilling prophecy.
that we were talking about. Hmm. Uh. Okay, it looks like we lost her. We'll give, some, give her some time to come back. I'm here. Oh, I'm here. Hi, there you are. <laughs> I, was that your system or was that me? I, I think it may have been you. Okay, whatever. I came back. Did you guys all hear that quote though? Yes. Okay. All yeah. right. So that's where I stopped. So, so it says in Kali Yuga that, um, you know, we're not really responsible for our thoughts. However, in my experience, the more I take responsibility for my thoughts, the more I can watch them, then I can watch my, my beliefs. I can watch you know, what actions I feel that I wanna take because of that belief. I can actually practice something new. So to me, rather than just saying I'm, I'm worse than or I'm better than, really an acceptance of who I am as Jiva. I am Jiva Tattva. I am small. I'm a Jiva Tattva. And as a conditioned Jiva, I have the tendency to make mistakes, to be illusioned, to, to cheat, and my senses are imperfect. So that's just how it is for a conditioned Jiva. And so I don't have to be upset about that, but I can take responsibility. Oh, I made a mistake. I don't have to hide that I made a mistake. I can say I made a mistake. And, and how can I rectify that mistake? Um, and, you know, some mistakes that we make are more um, devastating and they have more impacts on us than others. Um, for instance, um, you know, if someone has killed somebody, <laughs> That's a mistake, but that mistake, you know, goes along with you your whole life. You can't really make up and bring that person back to life. Um, there was an experience that I had with my daughter where I was not really being attentive and she cut her eye. And so she's blind in her eye for her since she was four. She's now 40. So that's a mistake that I made that I can't unchange that mistake. And I can't really compensate for it. However, you know, how can I develop my relationship in order to create the best relationship I can have right now, despite what I did in the past? And so it's really an, a self-acceptance. It's an acceptance of our jivaness. And it's really um, only we and, and when we accept ourselves as we are, with the frailties and the weaknesses and the conditionings that we have, as we accept those, we can then move forward in life with a different energy. So does, does, that, does that help, Heather? You're muted. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that definitely helps. Yeah, and it's a day by day process. It's just each day, what am I thinking? Oh my God, what am I believing? Oh, you know, like what could I do today? And creating something brand new out of the box. Who can I be today, you know, that would in inspire me? <clears throat> Who can I be today that would inspire me? It's a day to day thing. I guess that there's other things that come up too. And, um, you know, with people from trauma hood from childhood, you know, yes, like especially yes. like in my case and whatnot, like my brain is not wired in the same way that other people's brains are wired. And right yes. now I'm saving up to get a brain to get my brain scanned. Okay. Um, which I'm kind of excited about because, you know, I have yes. all these different diagnoses and like how do you how do you function with the mind through the mind to overcome the mind, you know? So well, you're doing, you're doing it. And then the, the mind is a part of a body, part of the body too. And a lot of times trauma is also stored in the body and the central nervous system. So if you can do some somatic work, somatic means body, yeah. somatic I mean, experiencing, 
Mm-hmm. I'm in therapy. I'm doing my stuff. I'm doing doing Yay! the work. I'm, I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to like make it a point out there that sometimes people aren't aware of this. Yes. That like yes. our brain, literally, like my brain does not fire in the same way that other people's do. Absolutely. Do because like it's not. It's a little and neurodivergent. When you, and when you were when you were young and you were developing as a young girl your brain started firing and wiring in a way to protect you, which, yeah, you know, now. And I've learned now that as an adult too, how those firing and wirings, like that fence example you gave of the tree has been very detrimental on my life. Like, yes, I mean, I'm 36 years old in the past 16 years, I've been fighting to become an adult, you know, like how to like fight through all this stuff. So it's a lot to uh, come through, you know, I mean, I'm still only 36. I got a long way to go. So I'm not worried about yeah, it. Yeah, I feel yeah. great for all yeah, of that. Yeah. But I just wanted to bring up that point that it nice. definitely can change the wiring in your brain. Yes, it does. And can I, I'm just going to make a request. Can you use another word than fighting to oh. overcome this? Can you choose another word? Choose another word than fighting. Um, striving. Mm, let's not see. Good. What, what would inspire you? Because fighting doesn't seem very inspiring. I mean, I know it's gonna, you know, it's motivate you, but what would motivate you that would be more inspiring? Hmm. Creating. Creating, creating a space to honor myself, my true self. How about that? Yeah. I'm creating okay. spaces in my life to honor my true self. And just choosing words like that, because it seems that you had to fight a lot in your life to survive. So if you say I'm fighting now to get out of this, it's a little bit more fighting. Yeah, but I use that term of fighting. Like I think of myself in the shoes of Arjun almost every day because we're on a battlefield. Like every day we're on some kind of battlefield, whether we're being a spiritual warrior, sometimes having to be a physical warrior or whatever else. Okay, if that works for you, you can use it. But I do like the creation. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a creative warrior or a peaceful warrior. You can use the word warrior. Yeah, a peaceful warrior looking to honor my true self. Yeah, with vigilance. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so how much more time do we have left, Tiffany? I'm sorry. I think you have 38 minutes. Okay, okay, got it. So I'd like to hear from some other persons. Um, we've got Melissa, we've got DJ, uh, Niru, Himu, Radhi Karina, Sangeeta Priya, Jennifer, Juicy Juicy, Rangini, another Gail, and then another telephone number. So anybody else who'd like to share what they heard, what they learned, or a question they may have. And did I answer your question, Gail? Yes, I understood. By the way, Gail and the telephone number is the same person. Okay, have, got it. I have def- technical things going on. But um, yeah, so the way I understood you is that um, the, the relationship between strength and vulnerability is that you need, vul- you need strength in order to be vulnerable. Yes, yes. Because it can be painful. But I feel like, I, you know, it's a very critical aspect of that, I, I feel, is, is that you have to be extremely careful about the people with whom you are vulnerable. Otherwise, that can, like, backfire on yes. you. Yes, very good point. That's a very good point, Gail. Yes, especially when you're just first becoming vulnerable the people that you want to be vulnerable with would be people that you know are safe, that you know can keep confidentiality, that you know will create a, a non-judgmental safe space for you. Yeah, that is very important. And that's a good point. That's a good point. We don't want to just tell everybody everything because it may, yeah, backfire. Very good point. Thank you so much for that. I know you want to hear from other people, but I do have one thing if nobody okay. else. Okay. No, no, you can ask, and then the other ladies are going to prepare their questions while you're asking. Okay, yeah, just following up on, on your response, um, I think it was the crucial before. Um, <clears throat> you know, you were saying that sometimes the 
perpetuate a story that we made up. But I feel like sometimes we don't actually make it up. Like, you know, if somebody tells you point blank to your face, like, well, you know, you know, I don't, I didn't want you or, you know, or whatever else, um, you know, or, you know, if you're told, I really wanted a boy. I mean, you didn't make those stories up. So no. it's, the story, it's the story that we make up that we, we, we attribute that rejection to everybody instead of just to the particular person who, who gave us that story initially. Yeah, we make, not, it, we make it mean something about us. That person rejects us. They say something like that. I didn't, I don't want you. You're not, you're not my kid. And we make it mean that I'm unacceptable. I'm rejected. I'm unlovable by everybody. Yeah, we kind of identify with that. And it's now it's, it's who we are. It's not what that person said. So yes, that's the story we make up. We make a story up about ourselves. Somebody says mm -hmm. something, and then we make it mean something about us across the board. Okay, that means yeah. clarifies. Yeah, things. especially when it's a parent, because our parents are our first gurus, and they're kind of like God to us, you know? Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or whoever has that kind of role in our life. Yes, you know? yes, yes. Whether it's parents, grandparents, teachers, siblings, yes, yes. absolutely, absolutely. Is there anybody else that would like to say anything? I, I see a comment from Hemo, okay, thank you, Hemo, has to take off. And Juicy Juicy, did you understand my point? Because you, you made a comment that I, please repeat that. Did my repetition help? Um, you did repeat it because I, I think I didn't catch it. But, you know, I found out that this is going to be recorded and available. So I'll just tune in when I hear that recording. No, 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 no. Ask me your question of what part don't you understand? Well, it wasn't that I didn't understand it. It okay. was when you said your words turn into this, this turns into oh, that. Oh, 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 that statement that I made. Yeah. Yeah. Your thoughts turn into your words. Your words create your actions. Your actions create your habits. Your habits create your character and your character creates your destiny, something that you repeat over and over and over again. So you want to look at what are the repetitive thoughts that you keep telling yourself, because those repetitive thoughts are the ones that's like a tape loop. Those are the ones that are going to really cause um, things to happen in your life in one way or another, depending on what the tape loop says. Mm -hmm. So you becoming know, aware, go ahead. Around that, and I'm so sorry, I tuned in late. That's fine. Around that, um, see, I'm trying to tie that, <clears throat> tie that in with um, Krishna and uh, our thoughts, gosh, um, as devotees, mm -hmm. those who are devotees, how how is it that when we're so loved by Krishna that these negative thoughts just take over when we should sort of know better? But believe me, I, I know that I don't know better. And, it, you know, I do have my specific repetitive loop of thoughts and words for right. sure. Right. But, but how is it, is it? Is it just a matter of being a, a more mature devotee or what what is it that allows us to be in the case of bad thoughts treating ourselves so badly They're very that's a wonderful question yeah um you know you know we should know that krishna loves us we 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 theoretically know that we're not this body and we're not this mind and we theoretically know that krishna loves us and yet these 
conditioned thoughts have been with us since time immemorial. And as we work our way through the material energy, we're working to dissipate these lies which cover the truth that we theoretically know, but we don't emotionally know. And so um, um, you can say, uh, to, me, uh, to me, spiritual maturity is connected with emotional maturity. Um, we wanna look at the judgments that we're making about ourselves and the judgments that we're making of others because these judgments tell us a lot about, they tell us a lot about our conditioning. And then, you know, as we judge ourselves, we may also judge other people. And um, in the Bhagavad Gita, technically, theoretically, we understand that we're not attached or adverse um, to anyone or anything. That's, that's the nature of being equipoised. So we just want to know where are the where are the the things that stop us from understanding that truth? What are the thoughts that stop me from really realizing and experiencing that Krishna loves me? Does does that make some sense to you? Um, it 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 does make sense. Um, it's in terms of changing my thoughts it's something that i have worked on for some time unsuccessfully uh -huh. i will say quite unsuccessfully because it it has to do with your belief system yes and what what you really believe and you can say oh thank you for this happening to me but then you're really seething inside right you. right yeah so you have to be in the reality of where you are so if you're seething inside that means there's a need that's not being met and whatever this thought or this you're trying to meet some of your needs so if you're seething inside that means your needs aren't being met it's very important that we meet our needs not that we just change our thoughts so that we're thinking the right thoughts or we paste on tops on paste on good thoughts on top of feelings of anger, resentment, hurt, shame. We can't paste good thoughts on top of those feelings. We need to dig deeper. Why? What is that feeling telling me? What do I need? I need some respect. I need some consideration. You know. And generally, what I found is, you know, we didn't get that when we were young but we don't know how to give it to ourselves. And so we continue to try to, try to get it from others outside, which can again be frustrating. So really the self-awareness and then the self-care and the self-compassion, how can I take care of myself? How can I honor myself? How can I respect myself? What could I do? And asking ourselves questions, what could I do that would honor me? What could I do that would be, um, you know, respectful? So does that make sense to you? And did you want to get, did you want to give a specific example so we could maybe make it more no, real? I, I no, think, I think that um, probably everyone got the gist of it. Like you said, you can't yeah. take positive thoughts on top of negative thoughts. Or but negative feel or feelings, I'm, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, yes, negative feelings, which uh, which means equals to me a lot of digging, a lot of digging for the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a process that can take your whole life. Yes, yes, and 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 to be grateful that we have this life to take this because each time you discover something then you're at the next layer and then there's something more to discover and then something more to discover and something more to discover. And it's, and we are eternal beings and we're eternally growing. It's not like we get to a place where, okay, I got it all. I know it all. There's nothing more for me to do. Well, we're, well, we're still growing. We're eternally growing. Krishna puts his devotees in challenging situations. Why? Why does he do that? Because he wants to hurt them? Because he wants to make it hard for them? 
No, he wants them to grow in their love for him in new ways. He does that to his pure devotees. He does it to the gopis. So if you look at any life in the material world, if you look at a tree or a bush, they either have new branches coming out or the leaves are dropping off and the branches are breaking off. You either see those two phenomena. A tree, a living being is either growing or it's dying. Does that make sense? It, it does, which means that if you're in that growing or dying stage, before you die, you might just say, this is just too difficult. And you might just give up. And then you're always at square one. You okay, so this is too difficult. That is another belief. This is too difficult. What is it that you're trying to accomplish is too difficult. It's just in the moment. Wow, what is there for me to learn in this moment? There's not a place to get to. It's just what is there that, that Krishna, what would you like me to see in this moment? What would you like me to learn in this moment? Not as the ultimate absolute answer to everything forever. And so you're not striving to get somewhere that you need to give up that you didn't get there. It's more like a, a dance. Okay. Does well, that make answer, sense? It, it all makes sense. And, and your responses are so, they're so on point. But when you asked me if I had an example, I probably have enough examples for um, 10 volumes. Yes. And I was only, I, and you don't have to give any examples from your life if you don't feel like it. I was just saying it because sometimes it makes it more clear how to do it. The main thing is we've got conditioned thoughts and habits. When we can distinguish one, we can start being curious rather than judgmental that we have those thoughts and habits. And we can be curious like we could say, where did that come from? Or is there some other, is there something else under that thought that, that is that I need? And then like we might discover like, well, I need some, I need some consideration. I need to be access, access, feel accepted. I need, I need love. So then you can ask the question, well, how might I love myself? Where don't I accept myself? What could I do that would um, inspire me? And you just ask different questions. And when you ask yourself different questions, like an answer can come and you can just, in that moment, you just try something new in that moment. And then in that moment, you say, oh, well, that was different. Yes, it was different because you asked a different question and you did a different behavior. And then you, you might say, I want to practice this for a week. I want to practice this more. I want to practice this for a month. I want to practice this for six months. Well, so I need you. I need you to be the fly on the wall of my life. And then when I need these little bits of wisdom, you're like, I have a little thing in my ear and you go, this is where you should go. This is where you should go. But I know we all have to do this journey ourselves. I know it, that. It's not a should either. It's not a should where you should go or you shouldn't go. To me, when you make choices, it's like, like, like if you choose the right road or you choose the left road, if you choose the right road, there will be certain things that you learn, learned on that road. And if you choose the left road, there will be things that you learn on that road. But Krishna's guiding us and, and he guides us as we're ready to see. And, and he, he will never fail us if we take the right path, the, the, the one on the right hand side, not the correct path, but the one on the right hand side. And, you know, and, and it, it, he will be able to teach us what we need to learn on that path if we're open and willing to learn. The external circumstances are kind of like just the phantasmagoria of what we go through to learn. But Krishna can help us to learn in any phantasmagoria, depending on our openness to see and to learn. And there's no should or shouldn't. It's just 
you know, what could I try right now? Like what might be different to do right now? What would inspire me right now? And you just try on different things. Then when you see something that really works and that really helps, you do it again and you do it more. Like for me, I discovered that compassionate communication is just so helpful and, and it's, it's simple. It's not necessarily easy to do all the time, but it's very simple and it's very powerful. So I like things that are simple and that are powerful. So I like compassionate communication. So you start and, 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 I, and I learned how to practice that. So you choose things that work for you and what works for you might not be something that necessarily works for me. And what works for me might not be something that works for you. It's, it's what you can do. If, if, if I can lift 10 pounds and you can't lift 10 pounds, it's not conducive for you to try to lift 10 pounds. You're going to hurt yourself. But you lift what you can lift and you do what you can do. And then you also have the, you know, Krishna, I, I, I would like to learn how to be a, a personalist or, you know, and you, you state your desire to Krishna. And um, sh show me the ways to do that. But you don't put a time limit on it and you don't put an expectation on how it should look. You don't try to figure it out. You kind of use the circumstances of your life as a way to understand what may or may not help. Now, that was a, a big mouthful that I said there. Did you? <laughs> yes, I, I got it all. And thank you so much. I, I'm so sorry. I did not mean to dominate the conversation. I, I don't I think you did say a word, but thank you so much. Thank you. I, I don't think you dominated the conversation, but thank you. I'm the one that's dominating the conversations, but thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I would like to dominate the conversation. <laughs> you have another question. Well, let's just, just pause for one second. Does anybody else have a question? that they'd like to ask before we go to Gail. All right, we'll defer to Gail and you other ladies can just think if you have a question, you know, now is the time to ask. So go ahead, Gail. Yeah, um, the, the general question, then, then I have the sub question, which is more specific. General question is, you know, we we accept certain things theoretically, like um, uh, like you know, Krishna loves me, therefore I should love myself, you know. Um, but and when we're trying to do self care, how to process that information in a way that is meaningful and, and makes a difference to our heart. So that's the general question. The, 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 the specific sub-question is, you know, I was so intrigued when you were talking about making irreversible mistakes, you know? So like you were saying, you know, um, you know, you were referring to a mistake that you, you, you couldn't undo with your, with your daughter's eye. And so you said that, well, you know, I'm a diva, so, I part of part of that having that nature is that you know you make mistakes, but I don't know how that is how it's possible to to um, how you thank you actually, huh? there was thank you I, I I got your question the specific so there's yeah. a lot of processing that goes on first of all there's the grieving. I really made a mistake. I really affected. And this is a grieving that every parent goes through because as parents, <laughs> we all do things which affect our kids. And then, you know, we always feel like, oh my God, what kind of a parent was I? And, you know, how did I traumatize my kids? Um, so there's grieving. There's a genuine grieving. Um, there's also a genuine maybe space to have the other person to express themselves to you and for you to hear their pain 
about what happened and just hearing it without any excuses, without any justifications, like saying I'm a Jeeva and I make mistakes. We don't say that as a justification or as an excuse to excuse us for our mistakes. We recognize it as kind of like, like a fact of life, but it's not a justification. It's not an excuse. It doesn't, mm, it doesn't release us from whatever reactions we will be experiencing due to that. And, and we're, we're open and willing, Krishna, whatever, whatever reactions may come to me due to that, you know, I, I accept them. You know, we don't say, oh, no, why is this happening to me? We, we accept what comes. So there's a lot of processing that goes on to work through that. Um, it's, and that's what makes realization. Realization comes from being real. We got to be real. That means we really experience the grief, we really experience the pain of the other person. We really hear it. We, we can feel it. We accept it. We empathize. We don't justify. So we, in reality, we go through these different stages in different ways. And so then asking myself the question, who can I be now as a mother? Who can I be now as a mother that I wasn't when my children were littler? And I'm being much more of a mother now that my children are older and they have children, I'm being much more of a mother and, and a way different mother than I was and way more present because I was so anxious as a young mother in a young movement, you know, trying to fit in and, and, and do what I was told and be good and prove myself and all that, which is the best that I could do at that point in time. So it's really a process and we process piece by piece by piece. It's not that we talk ourselves into these realizations. It's that we, in reality, practice bringing new experiences, practice being, how could I be a mother? How can I be a supportive mother now? What can I do? I'm still a mother. I didn't stop being a mother. I'm still a mother. What can I do as a mother now that may, you know, support my children and grandchildren? Did I answer your question, Gail? Um, I think so. I, I have to process it, your it, answer, but, but it seemed like, you know, like you said, it, it's not something that you, you know, like these theoretical um, concepts that we accept. It's not something that you can, I guess, talk yourself into by- Perfect. <laughs> Those are the exact words that I was thinking in my head. Yeah, you well, I got them from you. Okay. <laughs> you, just said, you said them. <laughs> yeah, you can't talk yourself into it. I said that? Yeah, yeah you did. That's, I got, I, it's a direct quote. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you can't- yeah, so, so that was- yeah, helpful to hear that you know you 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 just by repetition, and so the alternative to just like you know making a mantra out of these things that we accept is to can you fill in the blank? <laughs> Practice something new. Practice something new. Practice something new. Going out of our box, going out of our comfort zone. Practicing something new that we would not ordinarily do. To, to some, practice something new that-, that would... Yeah, like previously as a young devotee, I would never spend time with my parents because they're, you know, they're not devotees and, um, you know, I'm, I'm not doing specific service for the temple. And so I'm in a little bit of a Maya. So I'm feeling some resistance to being with my parents. And so I'm here, but I'm not really here. And so, oh my gosh, and why are they doing that? And whereas if I can just relax and say, these are my parents, they gave me life, you know, how can I be interested in them and 
learn about them and hear from them, their souls and their souls in human machines. And even if they're not practicing my specific tradition, you know, they believe in God and, or, you know, and so how can I, how can I have compassion for them and spend time with them rather than having my body be there and resisting them? So, and the same thing goes for my kids. How can I be with my children as they are and as they aren't, you know, cause they're not doing life exactly the way I do life, but how can I love them unconditionally and accept them in the way that they're doing their life rather than advising them, trying to convince them, um, you know, pushing them, you know, like that. So it's a practice of, you know, practicing some new way of being like, who could I be that would emanate compassion and love despite what my mind tells me? How to imbibe that concept that, well, God loves me. And so, you know, what's an example of a new practice so that that becomes more of a... Yeah, you just practice. practice a quality. You pick out a quality. You pick one quality. You could pick a quality from the, 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 the qualities of a devotee. In fact, right now, I'd like everybody on the call to pick one quality that inspires them or excites them or um, just one quality. And, and then I want each one of you to like separately say and declare your quality and practice it for one week. And that means like, say I practice, I, like, I want to practice the quality of being, let me see, I'm going to do it too. Let me see. I want to practice the quality of being present and attentive in my life while I'm here with my, I'm, I'm in North Carolina with my daughters. So I want to practice the quality of being present and attentive. So that's what I'm going to practice for the next week. So then I notice when, when am I being spaced out? When am I being present? When am I hearing? When am I not hearing? So I monitor myself on that one quality for one week. So would somebody else like to say what quality they'd like to practice for one week? I can I'll say the one that I'm actually already working on and I've been I'm practicing it for a month. Okay. <laughs> it's humility. I'm working okay. on that. And and what does humility mean to you, if I may ask? Yes, no problem. Yes. To me, it means to be able to um, you know, well, first of all, like we've been talking about understanding that we are loved by Krishna and that uh -huh. um, you know, acting from that perspective rather than from my material ego, ego, false ego perspective of life. Mm -hmm. um, it also means um, not, you know, understanding that, you know, I am a being as well and I have some value as well. Mm -hmm. However, you know, other people have just as much value and making space for them and holding space for them as well. May I add yes, please, that? Please, yeah. yeah, so when I hear the word humility, I get nervous because a lot of times in my life, you know, this humility thing is like, there's something wrong with me and I just got to like hold my tongue and just, you know. So how about the quality of valuing others and valuing yourself? Yes, yes. So, so try that for a week and see if it manifests in surprising ways. Okay. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else go on, Heather? Isn't it Bhakti Sarasati Siddhanta that says that um, humility is knowing one's shortcomings? Um. Yeah, it, it could be. I don't, I don't know the quote exactly, but it, he does talk a lot about looking at your own uh, weaknesses and shortcomings. And I, I'd say, you know, that's to me what self-awareness is, looking at, you know, the stories in your head. So, um, but, yeah. oh, sorry. Go ahead, <laughs> I go just, ahead. That, that was, that was just a little thing I wanted to say, okay, but okay. then my, um, mine would, my practice for the week would be patience. 
patience. How about, can we add loving patience? Loving patience. Yeah, not like uh, angry patience. <laughs> <laughs> like, why aren't you patient? Loving patience. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. softening patience. Softening patience. Nice, nice, nice. And maybe acceptance. I'm just saying, because with this acceptance, there's a little more patience because it, it, it might be a like a stepping stone to patience. Right. Just a thought. Some <laughs> radical acceptance. <laughs> I like that one. Radical acceptance. Well, that's a skill, actually, to radically accept something, because oh. whenever, when, every, when anything happens, no matter what it is, even if like, you know, something tragic happens right in front of your face, if you can radically accept it as happening at that moment in time, then you don't have to necessarily not, you don't have to, you can be sad about it or happy about it or whatever emotion about it. But if you radically accept it, then you don't fight it as not being reality. Ah, and therefore, okay, when you I fight see. something as not being real, that's when you invite suffering. I see. That's true. You got that. You, you, you're a good teacher. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to go in the order that I see these things. Kushbu, would you like to pick one out? I'm just putting people on the spot here. Actually, I was actually I was not here. Like I went over to the kitchen to close okay. the kitchen. Yeah. yeah, you just pick one quality that you'd like to practice for one week. Okay, I would like I would like to uh, concentrate on what I have rather than what I don't have right now. So say that again. I would like to concentrate on what I, what you have I rather have than what you don't have. Life. How about gratitude? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gratitude, gratitude. for what there yeah. is. Okay, that's nice. Thank you so much, Melissa. What would you like to practice for a week? I write. Uh, I can write on. A, on a, Yes, you can write it on a paper, put it on your I can share it with my uh, friends. Uh, you so can that, share it, uh, yep, make the declaration that so that you've got am, more support. So that I'm truth, I'm honest with my thing. Yes. I'm just, I'm just not saying I'm actually doing it. Nice. Because they will be vigilant of hey, what happened, so I can yes. share it. Because when we read proper books together, like I have a group of friends, so uh, we share our realizations together. So I can yes. put in my one uh, line. Today uh, I am grateful about this. Thank you. We have three minutes left. So I want to give everybody like 10 seconds to say one word. Um, Juicy Juicy, do you have one? Uh, I don't know if you can translate this into something else, but non-speculative. Non-speculative. Um, how about curious? I like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because speculating is kind of like a little bit of a judgment. So curious, being curious. Okay. Practice that for a week. Okay. Yes. Anybody else? Sangeeta Priya. Just one word, one, one little word. JG. Sangeeta Priya. Yes. Hi Krishna, sorry, I'm in. I'm also in the middle of cooking here, so I'm okay, really yes. sorry about that. Oh. Yeah, um, <laughs> Harry Bo. Um, <laughs> um, forgiveness, I would say. Forgiveness okay. is something that is really prominent for me right now. Okay, great. Forgiveness, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much for saying one word, and I'm nice. And I'm glad, grateful to hear your voice. Yeah, you too. Thank you. <laughs> Hari Bo. Hari Bo. Um, Radhika Karani. You have one, one word. Uh, or Renjini, do you have one? Yeah, compassionate to compassion. Compassionate. That would be. My... That would be to everybody, including you. Yeah. Self compassion and compassion to others. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. Uh, we'll do another order. Like Melissa, you got one. We've only got three more people to just give one word. Or JG or Radhi, Radhi Karina, Karani, Radhi Karana. Maybe you girls are in the middle of doing something. 
Okay. All right. Well, we've got one more minute and I'd just like to say thank you very much for all coming and for your participation as much as you were able to participate. I know that our lives are very busy and this is sometimes a busy time. And um, yeah, your time and your attention and your interest, your curiosity, your desire to grow, um, your desire to um, find yourselves and honor yourselves. So thank you so much. I just want to say bancha kalpa chibis cha kripa singa bhi Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Wonderful class. Thank you for taking us in depth and leading us into healing and also for helping us reframe the concept of anartas and really understanding it better. It's so important for us to, in order for us to advance in spiritual life. So thank you so much. Yeah, reframing is a big thing. Once we reframe things, uh, they, they, it's pers our perspective of them changes. And that's, that's how we grow, changing our perspective. Have you written a book on all this? Uh, I am in the middle of writing a book, uh, one on the mind and the false ego, one on the anartas. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I don't have so much time this summer because there's a lot of outside activities, but um, they're just, they're in the editing stages. So. I think I'm going to be the first buyer. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to make it interesting also, not just theoretical kind of, so we'll see. Yeah. Well, wonderful. It's, we look forward to your books. We can't wait yeah. to get them. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you the title. the title. The title of the first book is Finding the Gap, Some Truth About the Lies We Tell Ourselves. Mm. And the second volume is Entering the Gap. That's about the Anartas. Entering the Gap, More Truth About the Lies We Tell Ourselves. So anyway. Beautiful. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, so thank much. you so much. Have, you. have a wonderful you. day, thank night, you. evening. Bless you. you as well. And please come back, ladies. We have more um, sanghas and bond of love interviews coming. So keep an eye out for our newsletter and on social media. Thank you all for being here. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank